Can you list every single concept that you need to know to build microservices using Java and Spring Boot? It's no small challenge, and with new concepts and features emerging all the time, I figure we need a quick and easy way to keep in the know. So in this series, I'm going to draw on my 15 years of coding experience to explain the most important aspects of a microservices concept in 10 minutes or less. So let's start things off with service discovery. So here's what we have coming up in this video. We're first going to answer the question, what is service discovery? We're then going to explore how it works. And then finally, we're going to go through the implementation options available to you. So let's start by answering the question, what is service discovery? So let's start with the basics. In a microservices architecture, you typically have several microservices that can communicate with each other in some way. We can divide that communication into two major categories. We first have asynchronous non-blocking, and then we have synchronous blocking. So in the category of asynchronous non-blocking, you have various different styles, and this includes things like event-driven architecture and async request response. However, as there's typically a technology such as a message broker, which handles all of the communication, we're not going to concern ourselves with asynchronous non-blocking in our discussion of service discovery. And that's because this way of communication doesn't always need service discovery. So which does? And that brings us on to the synchronous blocking category of communication. And there is one style in here, and that is blocking request response. And this is where we have service A sending a request to service B and expecting service B to respond in a reasonable amount of time. And this includes implementations like REST API calls or GraphQL or RPC. So if service A needs to send a request to service B, it needs to know where to send that request. So it needs to know where to find service B. A simple approach like hard coding addresses may work well in development, but as the number of microservices increases and as we horizontally scale each microservice, the challenge becomes a lot greater. After all, it's typical for a microservices network address to be assigned dynamically. So how could you know that ahead of time? How could you possibly hard code for that? And that's where service discovery comes in. So let's now explore how service discovery works. And at a high level, it's a two stage process. We first start with registration and then look up. So let's start with stage one and that's registration. In this stage, each microservice registers with a service registry. The service registry stores information such as the type of the microservice that's registering and also its network address where it can be reached. In this way, we can have multiple instances of the same type of microservice registered, but available at different network addresses. And that brings us on to stage two, and that's lookup. In this stage, let's say microservice A needs to make a request to microservice B. What it will do is first look up microservice B's network address in the service registry. And it's the network address that's provided by the service registry that microservice A will use to make a request to microservice B. And with that covered, let's now discuss the implementation options for service discovery. Now I would posit there are two main ways to implement service discovery in a microservices architecture. The first one is at the application level, and the second one is at the infrastructure level. Which microservices concepts are blocking you right now? Is it the API gateway? Is it messages and events? Let me know in the comments below. So first, let's explore the application level. Implementing service discovery at the application level requires that you run some kind of service registry. An example of this might be HashiCorp console or possibly Eureka. In addition to this, each microservice that you run needs to include the relevant library that allows them to communicate with the service registry. So you might be wondering what that maybe is all about when it comes to Eureka. Whereas Eureka version one is still actively supported, Eureka version two has been discontinued. In addition, a number of the Netflix OSS components have also entered maintenance mode. So it's always worth checking the support when you're picking your service discovery technology. The good news is that the Spring Cloud Console project offers a nice easy way to integrate console with a Spring Boot application. However, if you do have other microservices written in other languages and frameworks, you may find that the library support for them may not be as good. So that's worth double checking. But on the upside, this solution is completely platform agnostic. It doesn't matter which platform that you run on. It's even possible to split your microservices across multiple platforms, as long as they're reachable and they can register with console. So the other way to implement service discovery is at the infrastructure level. This approach is completely handled by the infrastructure and technologies like Kubernetes offer this out of the box. In the Kubernetes approach, we declare a Kubernetes service that would point to a specific type of microservice, in this case, microservice A. 
The Kubernetes service then exposes a DNS name, which can be used by any microservice in the cluster to communicate with that specific type of microservice. And this approach works regardless of the number of instances of that type of microservice that you're running. The Kubernetes service will route traffic to your various instances a little bit like a load balancer. With the Kubernetes service set up, all that remains is to configure each of the microservices to use that DNS name. However, each of the microservices must be running in the Kubernetes cluster in order for that DNS name to work. So you may be asking the question now, which one do I use? Obviously, this all depends on your specific circumstances and your requirements, but here are some general guidelines. If you're running, say, five microservices or less, consider that you may not actually need service discovery. After all, it doesn't come for free, it adds additional complexity and sometimes additional infrastructure to manage. If you decide that you do need service discovery, it may be worth asking what else do you need, because Kubernetes offers a lot out of the box. And although it's my preferred means of implementing service discovery in a microservices architecture, it's a fairly heavyweight solution. If you reach this point and decide that you do need service discovery, but you don't need all of the features that Kubernetes offers, then consider using Spring Cloud and Console. As usual, the Spring Docs are excellent and help out a great deal when setting this up. But service discovery is just one of the many decisions that goes into building using a microservices architecture. So if you're curious on the process that I use for my builds, you can find that information in this video right here.